chair is Dr. Um, um, Kyrie Baker, who is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. She received the NSF Career Award in 2021 and led an award-winning team to optimize extremely large scale um, power grids on real-time scales in the Upper E Grid Optimization Competition. And uh, if I'm not um, incorrect, I think this is a recording that we have for um, Dr. Barker. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Kyrie Baker. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I also have a joint appointment at the National Renewable Energy Lab and my group is called the Griffin Lab on the upper right hand corner, the color scheme. Uh, is, is there a problem with video? Sorry. Uh, sorry, what's happened? Is, is there a problem with the video? I can see Herman raising his hand. I think that was maybe from earlier in this. Uh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I'll restart this. No I'm sorry. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Carrie Baker. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I also have a joint appointment at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and my group is called the Griffin Lab. On the upper right-hand corner, the color scheme uh, matches the ACME energy scheme, so that's cool. Um, and I'm going to be talking about my notes paper today, um, which is, again, that short, just a short 15-minute presentation about solutions of DCOPF and why they are never AC feasible and what implications are there of that, if any. Okay, so just in case you're not familiar with AC optimal power flow, um, this is sort of considered the ground truth for um, power systems optimization. We consider the AC power flow equations to be the best physical representation we generally have of how power is flowing in the grid. It's minimizing a cost function that's a function of active power um, of the generators times their cost coefficients. This is changing uh, markets and I, different ISOs are having, you know, demand side bidding, sometimes negative uh, coefficients here. But in this particular paper, we're gonna use the standard formulation for ACOPF, which is non-zero uh, positive coefficients of A, B, and C, and um, just active power from generators in the cost function. The next two constraints we'll see here um, are the AC power flow constraints. So this ensures that power flowing in is equal to power flowing out of a bus, in this case, bus I. Um, this is the voltage magnitude at bus I. This is the voltage angle difference between bus I and bus M. And this is summed across all buses M that are connected to bus I. On the right-hand side, you see any load that's at bus I subtracted by any generation that's at that bus. This is the reactive power balance. We have bounds on the active power and reactive power generation and bounds on the voltage magnitudes. I know it's a lot of notation. If you haven't seen it before, it's confusing, but um, it's in the paper. So what does DCOPF do? So DCOPF is what's actually used in more market operations than ACOPF, mainly because it's computationally much more tractable. So DCOPF has a series of assumptions and engineering assumptions that we make about ACOPF. So for example, we assume in DCOPF, the resistance of the lines is significantly greater than the reactance of the lines. This results in lossless lines. We assume that voltage magnitudes are one per unit. And this problem solves a reduced form where the cost function is the same, but now the constraints are linear, which is really nice. And our variables in this one are active power generation and those thetas, um, the voltage angles at every bus. There's a very clear derivation, that I, uh, a link I posted at the bottom of the slide if you'd like to learn more about how DCOPF is derived. So one important thing to note here is people always call DCOPF a linearization of ACOPF, but it's actually an approximation of ACOPF. So linearization implies you're, linear, you're possibly linearizing around some point. There's some point that's touching the AC feasible region. Um, and this is where a lot of the confusion stems from, but DCOPF is actually an approximation that does not include uh, any points in the ACOPF problem. So who cares? Why compare these? Um, have, haven't people already compared these? And the answer is yes, a lot of people have compared DCOPF and ACOPF. 
um, in 2004, the Overby paper compared locational marginal prices, and we could see that it, in some cases, can be very different depending on if you're uh, calculating those Lagrange multipliers with DC or ACOPF. Um, the second paper uh, by Carlton Coffrin and others is about optimal transmission switching. So in this case, sometimes people solve um, optimal transmission switching. <sighs> Sorry, my flash is trying to update. There we go. Sometimes people solve optimal transmission switching, which is a mixed integer problem um, using DCOPF because it's really challenging to solve with ACOPF. But in some cases, turning off some of those lines that DCOPF said are optimal can actually result in really bad situations in ACOPF. And then of course, the approximation error of DCOPF has been discussed a lot. This has to do with LMPs. It also has to do with optimal transmission switching. This can be bounded, worst case errors can be found. So what does this paper contribute, if anything? If anything, it does contribute something. So I kept reading these papers and many of my students are reading these papers where you'll see statements like, a solution of DCOPF may not be, sorry, that should be AC feasible, may not be AC feasible. DCOPF is typically AC infeasible. And I kept seeing the soft language that says, maybe it's feasible, maybe it's not feasible, it's often infeasible. And so if you're, you know, beginning in this field, a natural question is, well, when is it AC feasible? When, it's, when is it not AC feasible? And I couldn't find the answer to this question easily. So I decided to dig into it. And that's what this paper answers is when will the decisions made by DCOPF satisfy those AC power flow equations? And the answer is never. Using the standard formulation and some assumptions that I'm going to discuss. Okay, so disclaimers. Um, thank you to the, everyone who has reviewed this paper, especially the industry professionals. I've had a lot of insight on when DCOPF is used in practice, what modifications are made to make it AC feasible. Um, DCOPF you know, in the form that I've shown is typically not the exact formulation that's used. Um, sometimes grid operators include other variables and considerations like N minus one security or, uh, you know, ramping constraints, something like that. In many cases, the software that's used to solve OPF solves DCOPF and then has an iterative procedure to make that point AC feasible. Um, you can read more in this FERC report. And it's important to note that these solutions can be equal. So here I'm showing the DCOPF feasible region and the ACOPF feasible region, uh, feasible in the sense of the voltages and the power injections, uh, active power injections. Here I'm showing there's no overlap. There can be an overlap if there are, there's no power flowing throughout the network. So in that case, the dispatch solutions can be equal. Um, if you're purely supplying the loads via power generation at your bus and there's no power flowing on the lines, then there's gonna be no losses calculated by the ACOPF and these solutions will be equal. Here an assumption is there's in some point in this, you know, thousands of buses network, one of the lines has to have power flowing on it. So that's the assumption that I'm making here. And another thing to note, I've used ACOPF um, begrudgingly, it has worked very well in determining, you know, maybe not AC feasible, but pretty close to uh, accurate um, generation set points. It does well in real systems. Obviously, we need to move towards a better operation of real systems, but it's gotten us this far. Um, and even simpler methods have gotten us far as well. Okay, so let's just talk about the two problems that I showed before. And this is a very obvious uh, result. So in DCOPF, the sum of the generation equals the sum of the load. You can get this by just summing all of the constraints. Um, or, you know, summing, you can get this by looking at the DCOPF problem. In ACOPF, assuming we have power flowing on one line somewhere in the network, the sum of generation is going to be greater than the sum of the loads because some of that energy is going to be lost to heat dissipation in the power lines. Thus, it is obvious that the generation set points determined by DCOPF will not be feasible for ACOPF. They're just, the sum's not equal, um, so it's impossible for the individual ones to be equal if they're all positive. So this is just a simulation of the 14 bus system. Um, the gap gets worse, so I just generated a bunch of random system loadings. Um, and you can see that the, the difference between the ACOPF solutions, the black dots and the DCOPF solutions just for the sum of the system loading, this gap grows. So the losses grow, the gap in the objective function might grow. Um, and so this is, this is pretty obvious. So 
That answered my original question, when is DCOPF gonna satisfy ACOPF? Never, because of losses. Physically, what would happen? So let's say we solve DCOPF, we implement, we send all the generators their set points, they start outputting that power, but we have one slack bus or maybe multiple, maybe there's a distributed slack bus or maybe there's fictitious load that's artificially increasing generation at the bus. And now for some reason we have a situation where the sum of the generation is the same in ACOPF and DCOPF. So we can't use our easy proof from the last slide. So if the generation is, the sum of the generation is the same, now do I have an overlap of the DCOPF and ACOPF feasible regions? So let's take a look at this. And I know I'm going really fast, but I wanna make sure I don't go over because that is annoying for viewers. Okay, so here is the ACOPF uh, AC power flow equation at some bus I evaluated at the DCOPF solution, meaning the voltage magnitudes are assumed to be one. So we have uh, basically the normal AC power flow equation, except now we plugged in the voltage magnitudes that DCOPF assumes. Now this right-hand side, if we're comparing and assuming, so the, the assumption here is that ACOPF and DCOPF are producing the same solution. Let's substitute the DCOPF uh, power flow equations on the right-hand side, because this is equal to this. So if this left-hand side is equal to this right-hand side, then this left-hand side should be equal to this right-hand side. So typically this angle difference is small. DCOPF does assume it's small, but in this case, let's just assume a big range. Let's make a less strict assumption that theta is somewhere between plus uh, negative 90 degrees and, and positive 90 degrees, so big angle difference. Okay, so two cases that we're gonna to have to, to look at to determine if there's an overlap in this feasible region. So here's the equation I'm working with. Case one, let's consider when the angle difference is between zero and 90 degrees, uh, not inclusive, 90 degrees. So if we take a look and we rearrange terms in this power flow equation, we can see that the left-hand side, after I rearrange terms, is greater than zero because cosine of theta within this region is positive. My Conductance GIM on line IM is, or sorry, on a admittance matrix uh, entry IM is positive. So this whole left hand side is positive. My right hand side for theta within this region, I'm going to get sine strictly less than its argument. So that's going to be a positive number. My BIMs are going to be negative. So therefore, a negative number times a positive number, this whole right hand side is negative. Can't have a positive number equal to a negative number. So that me makes me think that, yeah, the ACOPF and DCOPF are not producing the same solution, even when the generation is the same. So case two. So case two is a little bit uh, trickier. I'm now looking at the negative 90 degrees to zero degrees case for theta IM. I'm taking this power flow equation and differentiating it with respect to theta IM. If I rearrange the terms on the left-hand side, I'm getting a G of, GIM being greater than zero, sine IM being greater than zero within this range, or sorry, less than zero within this range. I'm taking a negative of that. So that whole left-hand side is positive, sorry, non-zero. The right-hand side, I have a negative number. Cosine in between um, negative 90 and zero is going to be in between zero and one. So this is always going to be positive multiplied by a negative. This right-hand side is always going to be negative. So we have a contradiction in both cases, which means that even if I have generation values equal in ACOPF and DCOPF, I'm not going to have a situation where the angles will be feasible. So you might think, well, the generation is really what matters. Who cares about the angles? But if you read that some of those papers that I cited earlier, those angles are used to calculate line flows, are used to calculate congestion, market prices are used to determine whether or not we're turning lines on or off and optimal transmission switching. It also matters if those thetas are AC feasible, not just the generation values. Okay, so implications, conclusions. We've had a lot of papers and a lot of smart people develop approximations for ACOPF, true approximations, um, some relaxations. Is it time to finally move? Is it time to have market operations and grid operators move from DCOPF to some of these relaxations, SOCP, SDP, et cetera, too many to count? Um, or you know, is it time to just rethink DCOPF in general? And you know, this was on my laptop, I ran some, 
random load generate randomly loaded uh, using MATLAB, which is slow um, cases to see how, how long does it actually take to solve an ACOPF for a 9,000 bus system on a four-year-old laptop. So it takes a couple minutes. That's it. It takes a couple minutes. That's already faster than um, you know, most market operations. You can imagine that solving a standard ACOPF in many cases is already pretty fast. So it doesn't make sense computationally for us to use DCOPF anymore. It made sense in the in 1990s. Does it make sense in 2021? Eh, you know, I mean, for security constrained OPF, I think it does make sense. That's a really challenging problem. When you have topology changes, when you have binary variables, it's really hard to do the ACOPF. But if we're just talking about standard AC and DCOPF, there's not as much of an argument to use DCOPF. So this was just something I hope other researchers find useful because it took me, you know, more than a few minutes to answer that question of the feasibility regions. It just makes us a little bit wary about when we should be looking out for um, issues with DCOPF. So I'd be happy to take questions in the Q&A session um, or comments. Uh, and here's my email and my uh, group's website. Thank you. Hi, um, so uh, I'm not sure if we have um, Dr. Baker on the, the call um, or um, someone that can answer questions. If not, uh, maybe uh, might I suggest posting the questions in the Slack channel so that she can answer offline. Um, is that the best way to proceed, uh, uh, Ram? Yes, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't see her anywhere, but I just wanted to double check um, that she wasn't uh, online. So, so thank you, everyone. I think that concludes our um, session for today. Uh, and I encourage you all to hop on the Slack and, and if you have any follow up questions to, to ask there. So thank you. Thank you for sharing.